Um, Eleanor Ostrom is a strikingly, I think, unusual thinker. Sadly, we lost her in 2012, and she doesn't, I think, quite fit in neatly to any particular box. And some of you may have read all her stuff, be intimate with her, and I'll probably be very boring. Others of you, it would be completely new. So I'll, I'll kind of go through what I'm going to say, but we can take it in whatever direction you want to take it. Um, I have micro tenure. I'm 20% of a lecturer. Um, I am in the Green Party. I'm not not really anything. And um, what I'm kind of interested in is practical political interventions around climate change and the environment. But there is a crisis of climate change, ecological crisis, and rather boringly, that's all I'm ever really concerned about. Um, what I'm kind of interested in doing is how you can do something which is practical based on sound theories and ideas and so on. And I think Ellen Rostrom, when it comes to climate change, has something to contribute. Um, Ellen Rostrom, briefly to give you the introduction, um, was the only woman to win a Nobel Prize for economics. Now, some people will say there isn't, strictly speaking, a Nobel Prize for economics as a Swedish Royal Bank Prize and so on, but that be as it may. Um, there's been tradition of giving a prize, and I think it says something a little bit shocking about the sexist nature of economics, that she's still been the only woman to win a Nobel Prize for economics. And certainly one of the themes of her life was the sexist nature of economics, and she had quite a battle to be cut to, to win that prize, which I might briefly get on to. Um, essentially, she won the prize for uh, political economy. Um, within political economy, she came from the kind of new institutional school, so looking at rules and norms and so on and so forth. But what she basically won it for, and she, she shared it, was around the subject of commons. So her work is best known for looking at the tragedy of the commons and how we overcome the tragedy of the commons. So that's going to be a central part of what I'm going to talk about today. So um, you know, she covered commons, which are um, collectively owned forms of property. And she's a very paradoxical thinker, which makes her very exciting, because she kind of came from a tradition of um, economists like Hayek and James Buchanan, who would be seen quite on the free market right. Yet she's probably the greatest thinker after Marx about collective ownership. And the paradoxes pile up, which makes her extremely exciting. And she was very concerned with ecology, so she was an interdisciplinary scholar. So again, a lot of her kind of theory came from traditions of methodological individualism, but the, her kind of academic work always stressed collectivity. She had research teams, um, and I, I think she had no interest in, in kind of her career and what she was saying. It was much more about collective enterprise. So she believed to deal with climate change and other ecological problems, you need to have very good social science and very good natural science, and that's not down to one individual. And we get into ecology, she was given awards for ecology as well, diversity institutions, norms, governance, lots of complexity, and one important word is pragmatism. Um, I rather like this quote from Proust, or Proust, have you pronounce him, and I think this gives us a really good indication of how to approach an Rostrum. And I certainly do this. I look at a new thinker, and I think, wow, they're brilliant. They're wonderful. And I'm measuring it against my preconceptions and what I already believe. And I think she's a thinker that if we come with particular preconceptions, and we have a particular outlook, and then we see how close or how distant she is to our outlook, that's not a profitable way of thinking about what she does. So I thought this was, was great fun. Um, he was indeed in the habit of always comparing what he heard or, or read with an already familiar canon, and he felt this admiration quicken if he could detect no difference. Um, so I think with Ostrom, she's different to everything. Um, you know, and, and perhaps to kind of capture her kind of idea, it wasn't so much that she had a distinct academic idea that she projected and then kind of went into battle versus other academics. She was pragmatic in the sense that she had a particular question, 
and was interested in how you investigate a particular question and how you use lots of different tools from natural science and social science. So her kind of thinking, I mean, we all have preconceptions and ideologies and images and so on. I mean, you know, we're all products of thinking before us. Um, you know, it's open, it's keeping, exploring. So quite often people don't know anything about her, and then if people do know, they'll say, she was all about the commons, and she was the person who said how great the commons were. But she was famous for saying no panaceas. So when it comes on to the commons, she looked at the tragedy of the commons, which I'll get onto and link back to climate change, but she didn't think that commons were an automatic solution to environmental problems. She's very much getting away from the idea that there is one solution and that always fits. So sometimes I think people find the kind of complexity of what she's saying, that it can't be reduced to a simple slogan, as slightly disturbing. <coughs> Okay, so what would Eleanor do? Uh, this is a bit, a little bit of needlework, and there's a, a political story against this. I um, was a general election candidate. I'm not doing party politics at the moment. Um, and I stood in Maidenhead constituency. I don't know if you know that constituency. And there was Theresa May. Uh, Theresa May. So my wife, being a marked mistress of dark arts, and much more Machiavellian than me, but she would do her needle craft, my wife, in the front row of the debate, and she, this was the needle craft she did. She was thinking she'd distract, distract T Theresa May and might like, make my life easier. Theresa would have distracted anyway, but I thought this is quite a nice question with a lot of areas to say, what would Eleanor do? And that's my courgettes. Um, okay, so we're aware that there's a crisis of climate, I'm not a scientist, um, you know, there's been lots of nice tweets from here saying about hope, and I, I can give you, I don't think, absolute hope, I think we're in maybe a very, very difficult situation, um, certainly we were aware looking at the reports that there seems to be positive feedback mechanisms, dangers of the permafrost, defrosting, releasing methane, um, you know, so the, the kind of environmental situation is very um, worrying around climate change. And as I say, you have potentially positive feedback where um, you have a rise in CO2, other climate change <coughs> gases, temperatures rise, but things like release um, methane in the permafrost, and that accelerates it. And there also seems to be a kind of political positive feedback that we're in an age where there's more and more in uncertainty, insecurity, disruption. And there seems to be a kind of politics of populist leaders like, like Trump and so on, exploiting the uncertainty, which is caused by maybe a lot of the sort of worries about um, climate and financial crisis, austerity, so on and so forth. And then using that to bring in, you know, kind of drawn people's fears, you know, project racist images. So you have kind of populist leaders being elected and then almost doing whatever they can to accelerate climate change and rip up regulations. So we're in a very kind of worrying situation. Uh, but as I said, I think Eleanor Ostrom's work has got some implications to begin to help us to deal with climate change and of course other ecological problems because there's a whole web of ecological problems and climate change is you know, maybe the most obvious but, but not the only one. Um, so I think one approach to climate change um, is, you know, Extinction Rebellion, which I'll talk more about, um, drawing attention, and there is this kind of drive to have a climate emergency and say we must do something. And one of the things I think Eleanor Ostrom warns us about is that it's not enough in environmental policy just to say do something that you get unintended consequences, results you haven't thought of, complex situations. So that's something which is where I think she's useful. Okay, so these are the kind of basic biographies, born in 1933. I always think she's a bit like the sort of uh, Johnny Cash of economics, the way I was born poor. 
and uh, she talked about her interest in the environment, which is quite unusual for kind of people that come from quite a free market economic direction, in terms of like the depression and the Second World War and her parents getting divorced and to get by, um, you know, they grow things in the garden and she was carrying peaches and so on and so forth. So she had a sort of practical ecological lifestyle ethos from her very earliest days. And her biography is very interesting. She'd talk about all the sort of accidents in her biography. And she would say one prominent thing that kind of got her moving was she um, had a stammer. So she had, had a stammer and found it difficult. And as a sort of killer cure, which seems very brutal, at school, Beverly Hills High School, um, they put her into the debating society. Um, but she said that was great because she would, in the debating society, debate one point of view and then debate the opposite point of view, which I think is a very good skill, makes you very mentally flexible. Um, you know, so we're never quite sure whether she's Marx or Hayek, all sorts of different things. You know, she's like an economist, she's a political economist, her economics is all about ecology and various contradictions. And she said she was lucky to go to Beverly Hills School where all the rich kids went and the Hollywood stars and so on, just by an accident of geography. She was like the poor kid who went to the school. And she said that it was good going to that school because they really pushed kids to go into university. And she went into university, studied politics, and particularly enjoyed the economics <coughs> units. Um, she came out with her undergraduate degree, married her first husband, um, worked I think as a, in you know to support him get through law school and then she decided she wanted to do a PhD in economics so first thing that happened was her husband was against that so she divorced him <laughs> um, but being Eleanor bless her she said even divorce is negotiation yeah? <laughs> and then the second thing was she decided how to do economics and they went uh, you can't do economics because you haven't got any math yeah, and the reason she didn't have any math was that when she was in high school, she wanted to do calculus and higher maths, and she reported that they told her, what use will that be to you when you're barefoot and pregnant? Um, I don't know if it was quite that literal. So the irony, looking at sort of ca careers in economics, it's very maths-based, which she wasn't against, a lot of myths about Eleanor, um, but that was something that stopped women getting into economics, so she went for a you know, political economy. And um, when she did political economy in UCLA, there was like a scandal because four women had been awarded bursaries. Um, and she met um, Vince Ostrom, um, and they had to, he had to stop being a lecturer and they got married and he was a very interesting character as well. And obviously she would always stress that her work and Vince's work was network, yeah? I mean, in some ways what she does, you know, is a network and she's a node in the network and her kind of fabulous story is a good way of drawing attention to some important ideas. <coughs> and what she got interested in was common pool property, property which isn't owned by individuals or isn't owned by the state. <clears throat> and I always kind of say with her work that conventional economics is a bit like black and white television. You tend to look the market and the state and private property and state property and so on. And what she would say is there's a whole kaleidoscope of institutions that create goods and services and that sustain us there's a whole kaleidoscope of different property rights and forms of property, and so on and so forth. So she and Vince were studying West Basin, which was a you know kind of water network system in California, and she did stuff researching police and all sorts of things, and ended up in um, University Indiana University Bloomington campus, and. Um, one day her life changed completely because you had a individual called Garrett Harding. I'm saying things the wrong way. Um, do you know Garrett Harding? Familiar? Unfamiliar? There's some nods and so on and so forth. So Garrett Harding was a biologist and in 1968 he wrote what became the most cited scientific article in history. I don't know if this still holds and it was published in the journal Science, and it was entitled The Tragedy of the Commons. And in fact, it wasn't really science. 
But it was around this kind of concern in the late 60s, early 1970s, around environmental problems, resource depletion, um, so on and so forth. And we have the evolution of kind of green parties in the early 70s, environmental NGOs like Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth, and a wave of environmental concern. Um, he was fundamentally concerned with environmental crisis. <clears throat> Climate change wasn't so big then, but there was a notion that you had a globalization of environmental problems, and there was a debate as to the causes. And for Harding, as a biologist, his cause was people, overpopulation, too many of us. And that basically for him, what drove the ecological crisis was the fact that people would have children and more children and there was overpopulation and we would despoil the earth. So his real concern was population. But in the tragedy of the commons, he had a very powerful trope, an image, a narrative, which he used to argue that if you look at ecological problems, you need strong author authoritarian government. The idea is that if you leave things to people, to people's good nature and cooperation, inevitably we human beings would destroy the environment. Um, I think his linkage of the tragedy of the Com commons and population is rather odd, because um, his kind of argument was um, human beings should have fewer children, if you leave it to human beings we will have more children, and various kind of problems with that. But basically what he was arguing is that human beings we can cooperate, um, that we're self-interested in a way which is kind of destructive, and he used this concept of the tragedy of the commons, and I'm sure there will be a certain proportion of you who've never heard of this, and another proportion of you who will be rigidly bored because you've heard it 50 times, but I'll try and move through it. So, what he argued is that where you have property which is unowned, collective property, commons, like the traditional English common land, individuals would inevitably destroy that common land. Because what you have, what economists would talk about, game theorists would talk about, is you have a scenario called the prisoner's dilemma. And the idea of the prisoner's dilemma is about human beings' failure to cooperate. So the argument with the commons to conserve the commons, and this is an analogy for the whole kind of environmental crisis, if you have too many people putting their sheep and their cattle on the commons, you will erode the commons and destroy it. It will be overgrazed, trampled to death, and so on and so forth. And each commoner who had access to the commons knows that if they put more, if everybody's putting more cattle on, it will be destroyed. So your livelihood will be destroyed. So you know that you have to take cattle off, you have to conserve the commons. Another example of this, of course, is with fisheries. That you have a fisheries, um, you have people fishing, um, you get overfishing, and then that destroys people's livelihood in the future, because you've fished all the fish out. But according to the prisoner's dilemma, um, there's a whole thing, prisoner's dilemma, and prisoners, and shoplifting, and the police, and so on, which we'll not get into, um, you have a free rider effect. So every individual thinks, if I take my cattle off, or if I fish less, other human beings will fish more and make a free ride on my good nature. So if you have this kind of common situation, inevitably you will destroy the environment. Human beings are incapable of cooperating according to the model and according to Harding. So what you need to do is have some kind of strong central authority to come in and police us, very kind of Hobbesian very much the bit of the Bible I'm less keen on where they talk about original sin, um, you know, so on and so forth. So anyway, um, Harding was a big figure, lots of concern about the environment then as now, was doing various lectures, turned up at Bloomington campus, gave his lecture, and Ellen Rostrum thought, this is interesting, I'll go along and listen to him. And um, he said, as part of his speech, um, Population is driving environmental crisis. Human beings can't control, um, you know, population. Um, we need to compulsorily sterilise 
everybody, you know, when, when people have had like one child. So Eleanor Austin was rather alarmed by this and got up and said, um, you know, she wasn't a great polemicist, but she sort of rose to her feet, I can imagine this, and was, you know, rather taken aback and said, surely this is very totalitarian. And Harding said, no, it's not totalitarian. You know, I've got a theory that proves it, the tragedy of the commons. And then Eleanor had a brainwave and thought, well, well Vince and I have been studying commons. We've been studying collective ownership. And yeah, we're familiar with things like the prisoner's dilemma. And there's a potential when you have collective ownership that you might destroy the commons. But you don't always destroy the commons. Sometimes people can cooperate and maintain the commons. So that really set her off. And what she did was did huge investigations of various interesting implications. So one, for example, implication she had was that this was very interdisciplinary, that people studying management of the environment and fisheries and forests and so on that were collectively owned could be geographers, hydrologists, political scientists, political economists, anthropologists, so on and so forth. So what she did was try and come up with a kind of common language, common terms, looked at people's research and did a you know, vast investigation into it. So I'll, I'll try and tell you what she found. Okay, so what she basically did, and I'll get on briefly to the kind of rules of um, commons management and how you manage commons. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about different approaches of Harding and Ostrom. So to repeat, she wasn't saying collective ownership is always good. Um, you know, so some people would say the sort of Harding stuff in the Commons suggests that you've got to privatise the Commons and have private ownership, or you have the, the state to come in to run the Commons. She wasn't saying a universal solution to the problems of commons is have commons. She wasn't saying that collective ownership is a utopia or a panacea. She would say, you know, she wasn't radically against the state, although in many ways she was quite state sceptical. Um, she certainly wasn't radically against the market. So it's not, you know, to give you the warning that she would sort of reject states and reject markets and say everything is commons. Although I do think it's interesting when you have an economics Nobel Prize lecture and the, the title is Beyond Markets and States and one of the things I really like about Eleanor's work is she gets us thinking beyond the binary of markets and states. Anyway, to rein myself back onto the commons, what she was basically saying is that you have a problem or a puzzle or a dilemma, that you have some environments where it's difficult for them to be owned privately. So if you have fisheries, you can't really divide the seas up and have um, some people owning little bits of it. Um, she talked about kind of land ownership in say the Alpines, and there'd be winter pastures and summer pastures. You'd have patchy landscapes, and it wouldn't make sense for one individual to own a tiny bit of land and another person to own another tiny bit of land and have a connection between them. Um, you know, a lot of her economic upbringing was very much around sort of market-based economics, private property, and so on. But she would say there are particular situations where private share ownership, even if it is viewed as being desirable, is impracticable. So her starting point was not to say commons is the best way of doing things, but to say in some situations, things tend to be owned collectively, it's difficult for them to be owned privately, Harding was at least right to say there's a potential tragedy of the commons, of overuse and so on. And what she was interested in was how you deal with this problem. So one of the charms I find in her work is she starts with this very discreet problem of there's people who, who are fishing or they have forests or whatever, how they manage them in, in an ecological way. And then that opens up all sorts of economics, politics, philosophy, um, research methodology, and opens up a whole ragged, ever sort of growing sort of empire or universe of interesting thought. So she certainly didn't have like, you know, a discreet academic, this is how it is, I'm going to defend against others. It was this sort of open, pragmatic approach. Um, so what I was going to do before I get on to more of the detail of how you might run a commons which works and then link that to climate change was just to have some kind of contrasts, as you can see here, between Harding and Ostrom. So Harding, 
basically saw commons as a metaphor. He didn't study commons, they were a trope, they were a metaphor. They were basically really something in the science of rhetoric. They're a way of persuading people. And I think that's interesting and important. Um, for her, the, you know, you have commons, you have collective ownership, you have peasants, you have fish, people fishing. They've got a problem, how do we deal with that problem? So very different there. Um, Harding, of course, said that it's tragic in the sense of a Greek tragedy. Um, so Greek tragedy, it's not just that bad shit happens, but it's inevitable. Um, you know, that you go through the prisoner's dilemma and the various models, and inevitably we will destroy the commons. She would say, there's a dilemma, there's a problem, commons are potentially tragic, you know, there's a serious problem that it may be difficult to cooperate. So again, quite often I see things where people would say, she's disproved the tragedy of the commons, and, and she proved Harding wrong, whereas what she was doing, some, which was something which was rather more subtle, to say, there is a potential problem, how do we kind of deal with that? Um, Harding, privatisation may come in, but it was very much an authoritarian solution. And again, if you look at climate change and so on, it would fit in that you might need some very authoritarian state to take control and deal with us as human beings so that we, we work in a way which is ecological. Um, she was interested in potentially democratic solutions. So what she would say is with any environmental problem, there's maybe a problem of, you know, kind of rationing, a problem of people making decisions where they might lose some benefits and costs. So if people are actually in a situation where they can construct rules and participate democratically, if we do need to make sacrifices, we're more likely to accept them. So when we go on to climate change, she certainly believed in global agreements on it, but she would argue that at the grassroots, you've got, got to have people having a say and a participation and consult people if you want ecological politics to actually take hold. Um, complexity, so Harding, you know, very broad statement, um, Ostrom very much about complexity, and of course this is one of the charms and criticisms of her work, because she would say if you're dealing with the commons or climate change or anything, as I say, you need natural science and you need social science, and social science you need, you know, political economy and economists and so on and so forth, and legal theorists, and it soon becomes so complex you know, it's maybe difficult to, you know, kind of come at it. But I think that's better than a lot of, you know, broad brush of less complex approaches. Um, Harding was Malthusian, so if you've heard of Malthus, he was the, uh, the reverend in the uh, 18th century who said the poor would always be with us because of overpopulation, and if you have kind of like welfare and social justice, um, people have more children, and that's the cause of overpopulation. Well, she was somebody who was very much anti malthusian She viewed that there are serious ecological problems, that our consumption, our economy can influence them, but there isn't an inevitable you know, situation where we simply produce more and consume more and devastate the earth. So a different kind of view. Um, top down, so the Harding stuff is very top down. Um, the Ostroms are very into polycentric, so the idea there are multiple different centres we approach problems. So with climate change, you'd say you need a global approach and regional approach and cities and personal and so on and so forth, not simply one approach. Um, Harding was very much about government, you know, sort of the idea that you've got a state who will tell us what to do, whereas what Ostrom is concerned with is governance and the idea that all of us, right through life, make decisions, we negotiate, but politics is something that runs through all of human life, and we can think about this more rigorously and get better governance. Um, Harding, possibly being unfair to him, I, I view the, the tragedy of commons as something which is closed, whereas she has like an open approach to say, there is this problem of managing the commons, problem of environmental problems, and then you have like an open approach where you use various different forms of research to investigate it more. Um, so this is a sort of slogan for the <coughs> Ostrom workshop. So this is from, um, you know, so this is the kind of project. So how can fallible human beings, so we're not perfect, 
yeah, we're fallible, we can fail, we don't always get everything right. Um, so saying self-governing ways of life, so the idea is sort of radical democracy, deep democracy, participation, cooperation with others. Um, as well as sustaining ecological systems at multiple scales. So it's human beings and we're embedded within ecological, social ecological systems. So that's the, the kind of project which throws up lots of debates. Um, so the practical po um, politics of commons management, these are just some of my kind of random thoughts on it. So. One of the things I'm quite interested in is Spinoza, um, the Dutch prophet. So my wife always says, don't get him onto religion, so I won't get too much into religion. So Spinoza, I think, very interesting philosopher and had various thoughts about nature. And Spinoza's approach to a kind of problem or a debate was not to kind of shout at your opponents, um, but to actually engage with their arguments and look at the silences and contradictions in their text. So Spinoza had a particular problem in the Dutch Republic in the 17th century, that you had various religious groups, they were tied up with political authority, people were using different readings of the Bible for political purposes and to kind of discipline people. And what he did was looked at the Bible and the, the way that different authorities would say the Bible is the truth and then say, um, I'm not going to criticise the Bible externally, I'm going to read the Bible and I'm going to look at the contradictions and silences within the Bible. So for example, he would identify things like Moses couldn't have written about his own death, and there are all sorts of silences and contradictions. And Spinoza used this as a kind of argument to say, you know, some kind of religious commitment is appropriate, but if you look at the text, there are so many contradictions, it cannot be used as an unvarnished way of gaining authority. So this kind of idea of a symptomatic reading is you engage with the argument, you look at the silences and contradictions in it, you take it very seriously, and you use this to create a new body of theory. So I would see kind of Ostrom doing this with Harding that she wasn't just saying this is wrong or authoritarian, there's also been articles talking about Harding being a racist. Um, what she did was looked at the assumptions of the prisoner's dilemma, free rider, so on and so forth, and then looked from those assumptions, if you accepted those assumptions, how you could get something else, okay? So it's very much the argument that you can't reject free rider, prisoner's dilemma, tragedy, there's a real problem there, but how can we actually work with those assumptions to come up with something else? So in this case, it's engagement with the formal logic of the prisoner's dilemma. So the kind of prisoner's dilemma is this very abstract model to say that we cannot cooperate, cannot work with each other. Um, um, you know, it's, it's based on you have two prisoners, the police catch them, they don't have enough evidence, so the police say to the first prisoner, if you confess, you'll get a shorter sentence. Um, and then they go to the other prisoner, if you confess, you will get a shorter sentence. And of course, with both prisoners who are held in holding separate cells, they'll kind of say, well, the first prisoner's confessed, but you could get a lighter sentence if you confessed as well. And to maximise overall benefits to the prisoners, they should both shut up and keep quiet. But of course the fear is that the other prisoner will confess, so you're better off confessing as well. So that's a model which is used to explain kind of free riders and people disrupting the commons and so on and so forth. So what Ostrom would do with that model of the prisoner's dilemma is to say that it's about communication, it's about cooperation, it's about trust. And if you look at a commons and people working in fields or fisheries and so on, they're not prisoners who are isolated from each other. They can actually talk to each other, make decisions. And if you can actually build up enough trust, people co can cooperate to conserve. So what she's doing is taking this kind of symptomatic reading, looking at the model, looking at its assumptions and saying there's a problem of trust, that people need to trust each other to conserve, to take their capital off, and they need to cooperate. So how do we actually come up with ways of promoting trust and cooperation? And that's obviously very different from Harding saying that this very abstract model licenses, you just bring the states in, and they tell you what to do. 
Um, one of the phrases which I like very much is rather fun is what works in practice can also work in theory. So if you look at the economics, a prisoner's dilemma, a crowd of the commons and so on, the cooperation is impossible. The theory tells us that cooperation is impossible or very difficult. But what she found is around the world you had lots of examples of people disproving the theory. Um, and of course in economics a lot of it's based on kind of formal, logical ideas. And then if the real world is doing something else, you need to relook at your theory. Um, after much research, she came up with eight design features of successful commons that I'll briefly go through. So these design features, they're not for all time and space, but what she did was look at different examples around the world where people did case studies of successful commons, uh, of failed commons, and she looked for kind of features that worked to promote commons conservation. And at first she could see kind of no logic or rhyme, but she identified these eight features. Um, but they're not, you know, forever. Quite often I see people out there, you know, applying them to a whole host of different situations. And what she was doing was looking, using them to look at natural resources, commons like fields and fisheries and so on and so forth. If you apply them to the internet or so on and so forth and all sorts of other problems, they might have some purchase, but she wasn't designing something for all time and space. And where she does have insights, they, they need to be kind of, you know, married with practical research in the field to see to what extent they work. And certainly, you know, some of these design features, people have come on with more research and they, you know, develop them and change them and she's gone along with that. Um, so I'll talk a bit more about the features, but if we're looking at climate change or other environmental problems, there are many different ways of conceiving them, but one is to kind of conceive them as these alternatives of Malthusian, market utopian, and a kind of Ostrom approach. So the Malthusian approach is the idea that inevitably human beings you know, overpopulate, overconsume, we're going to destroy the earth, we need to restrain ourselves in some way, have like a very kind of hair shirtist existence. Um, another approach is very much a sort of market utopian, that we've always had environmental problems, but the market is a way of, um, you know, putting costs on things. Um, with the market, you develop new technologies, so we don't need to think about it. Obviously, the sort of eco-socialist views where you would see capitalism as the big core cause of kind of ecological problems. And I could kind of talk about where Ostrom does or doesn't fit with eco-socialism if you're interested, but I should really race through and then I can see what you are interested in, uh, which may be diverse. Um, and the Ostrom approach is basically to say, we can't simply leave it to the market. We can't simply leave it to technology. There are real environmental problems um, but having this kind of bleak Malthusian view also doesn't work, that there's ways in which we can manage things, we can bring in social science and natural science, so we make better, more efficient use of resources. Okay, so overcoming the tragedy of commons, so shocked and inspired by um, Garrett Harding, she went out there in the 70s and 80s and 90s, <coughs> Um, you know, right up to the very day she died, and the day before she died, she was um, 2012, um, she was still sending emails to her PhD students and working on things. And, um, so what she kind of did was to kind of investigate the commons. She took a case study approach. Um, I think she's very interesting in like methodology of economics, because economics is very mathematized based on formal logic. She wasn't against that, but she saw that was only one dimension of economics. So, as I say, what she did was look at the various case studies of long-lived commons. So, Torbill, in the, if I'm pronouncing it rightly, in the Swiss Alps, um, as being a commons which has been managed for over a thousand years. And um, Robert Netting, who did the research, had gone through the kind of records, and you had records going back to the 13th century. So, she looked at various, you know, um, irrigation systems in the Philippines. I know some of us in the audience have an interest in the Philippines. All sorts of different commons that have been successful. Um, some fisheries in the Black Sea that have failed. 
Um, so I looked at where other people had done, done case studies and stared at them and worked with them to try and see whether there was anything that we could take or not take. And of course, this is different from Harding. Harding wasn't researching the commons. It was much more of a metaphor. Um, and we could talk a little bit more about the history of the English commons. Um, she revisits, you know, as I say, the formal logic of the models. And as I've kind of said before, she found that cooperation while challenging is not impossible. Interestingly, she didn't say that cooperation is always good. Um, you know, she's a very subtle thinker. So in economics, there are strange things about cooperation. So you look at Adam Smith, who's a very fascinating, contradictory figure, and he would argue from our self-interest and our competitiveness and our rationality that actually creates a common good. Um, I sometimes disturb my students by saying that mainstream free market economics is really about creating communism. But it's interesting, isn't it, with Smith? Very competitive, rationalistic, but that leads to benefits for all. And in fact, what's interesting is with the tragedy of the commons, that actually challenges mainstream <coughs> economics um, you know, quite fundamentally. It's saying that if we are rational and self-interested, that ultimately damages everything. Um, but Ostrom would say, you know, cooperation isn't always great. You might have firms working in a cartel, so it might be firms producing biscuits, and they cooperate, and they trust each other, and they learn to overcome the prisoner's dilemma so that they can actually increase prices and rip us off as consumers. Um, if you look at the political economy of the mafia, which is a very interesting subject, generally the different families traditionally would cooperate. Um, you know, so cooperation isn't always good, but, um, you know, for the commons you need cooperation, building up trust so we can conserve the environment. If we think of global agreements on climate change, we need to build cooperation and trust as well. Um, so the commons design principles um, clearly defined boundaries, um, you know, to define who has access to the commons. So. Um, Quite often I go to Northmore in Cricklade in Wiltshire, which is a water meadow famous for its beautiful flowers, has been maintained as a common since at least Anglo-Saxon times. And with the commons, you have a community who own the commons. So we could maybe talk about the enclosure of the commons and how they've been taken away, but this notion of enclosure fits with kind of Ostrom's work, that commons have a boundary, they're not individually owned, but there's a community who have access to them, and then other people may be excluded. So that throws up interesting problems. Um, the rules about grazing or fishing or whatever have to be tailored to the local conditions, that what works socially, what works ecologically, might be different in the Swiss Alps, to, you know, the Wiltshire Cotswolds. You know, there's not going to be one set of rules which are universal. So we can think about this with climate change. The issue, say, you need global agreement, but where they manifest on the ground is going to be very diverse. Um, collective choice, so the people who are the commoners need to have a choice about the rules. So where you've got environmental problems, the people who are um, you know, impacted by the environment, the people making, you know, who, who are impacted by the rules, need to decide collectively. So it's this idea that to build up trust, if people have a say in how rules are constructed, they're more likely to have trust in them, trust other people. Um, effective monitoring, so this is very interesting. So, you know, Hardy would say inevitably we would overgraze, destroy the commons. So you need some kind of like policing, monitoring, you know, to see whether people are breaking the commons rules, going out and fishing out of season, putting too many cattle on. I don't know how many vegan alternatives to this. I should kind of work that up for you. That's a sort of new research area. Um, graduated sanctions, I think this is quite fun. So the idea is sanctions are kind of punishment, but if you have what the game theorists call the grim trigger, where you throw people out of the commons when they break the rules, that doesn't work because you need commoners to build the fences, maintain the commons. So if you're chucking people out and punishing people, that ain't going to work. And quite often people <coughs> might break the rules and overgraze or you know, break climate rules or whatever um, out of ignorance. So what you have with graduated sanctions is somebody breaks a rule, you know, you just tell them about it, or you then step up and you have a very minor 
punishment. Um, my favourite one is you had Japanese commons. Uh, what the commoners would do would club together and employ a um, constable who was paid in sake. And he'd find people in sake, and you know that, that I thought was quite a fun alcohol-based approach to it. Um, so you get the idea again, sort of environmental problems that you might graduated sanctions might be better than you know really kind of severe rules and checking people out, excluding people, and so on and so forth. Um, conflict resolution, so you need some kind of like mechanisms, you know, in with the British Commons whole system of manorial courts and so on and so forth. So if something really does break down, you have some kind of authority. There's all sorts of kind of in indigenous forms of law and justice and so on that would come into this. So you need maybe somebody you can trust. Um, Self-determination of the community, which is obviously interesting and brings in some politics and some ways we might <coughs> criticise Ostrom. She loved being criticised to move her ideas. But obviously, you know, you've got states and empires and colonialism and all sorts of things where people might not give you autonomy over your commons, interfere with you, impose rules, disrupting the commons. Um, Larger common pool resource systems are organised in the form of nested enterprises at multiple levels. So the, the idea of a the sort of commons metaphor is maybe too simplistic, that if we're talking about ecological social systems, you might have a field or a fishery, and then that's nested in a whole series of other systems. So what she was interested in was social ecological systems, you know, and a commons would rest into a much bigger environment. Okay, so I'll, I probably should shut up fairly soon because you can take this in various directions and ask me questions, see where you want to go with it. Um, she wrote a little bit on climate change and there are various papers that you can get hold of. So there are a number of things that she identified with climate change. Interesting, of course, that you have somebody working in political economy and they're obsessed with the environment and ecology and climate change and, and great. So, one of her points with climate change is polycentric solutions. I've talked quite a bit about this already, but she wasn't against global treaties and global agreements, but you would have um, you know, state approaches, regional approaches, city approaches, local authority, personal. There's a whole series of different centres and levels for dealing with climate change or other forms of environmental management. Um, I mean, for my sins, I'm a parish councillor. So on the parish council, it's, hey, what things can we do in terms of climate emergency and what practical things? And uh, I kind of was quite pleased. I said, well, we should have insect hotels. Can we have this on the agenda? And I was told by the parish clerk and the chair that this was so good, we didn't need to put it on the agenda. There just will be insect hotels in Winkfield. Um, so, you know, parish levels, sorts of different levels. Um, and of course, one of the practical things with polycentricism is, you know, when she was writing about this, as well as being quite a bedrock to her philosophy, you had George Bush, I can't remember, I think it was George Bush um, Jr. Re rejecting, you know, climate change action and so on. And she was saying that even though he's rejected that, you've got many US cities, um, you know, San Francisco, New York, wherever, where, where, the local, where the authorities, the cities are taking serious action on climate change. Um, you know, very impressed with Germany at very different levels, people being involved with climate change. And um, personally, when I met her twice, and so one of the times I met her, she was very proud of the um, solar panel she had on her roof. Um, her and her husband had built their own house as well. That's quite interesting. I think all economists do that. No panaceas. So, yes, it's good to be vegan. And it, it, good to elect green parties maybe, and it's good to have a climate emergency, but it's not a kind of sloganistic thing where there's one thing we do to solve climate change. What she would say with any kind of environmental problem, there's no panacea, there's no perfect solution. There's not a neat problem, cause, solution, which we campaign for. Um, you know, to borrow from kind of Freud, you know, think these things are overdetermined, but there are sets of different things that need to interact. So though she came from quite a market-based approach, which, as I say, is a paradox <coughs> contradiction because she was the greatest economist getting us beyond markets, 
Um, you know, she'd look at um, the prevailing approach to kind of climate change, um, you know, which is a very sort of market-based approach where, um, you know, there's carbon trading um, and the idea that you have a price for carbon and this is the way of kind of, you know, dealing with the problem. And she would say that's too simplistic, you know. Um, so she wasn't kind of coming out and saying market-based approaches the, to climate law is wrong, but she was saying that if that's your only approach, that's not going to work. Um, I mean, one of the things she's kind of drawing on is that, like a knowledge problem, that as human beings we don't automatically have secure knowledge, so you need to experiment, have different approaches, promote diversity, but you also need to act given the, the urgency. Um, I think straightforward point, but obvious and good if we're trying to kind of sell climate change, get people involved, is stress the benefits, not just the costs. You know, she, so she very much argue if we're dealing with climate change, we need to talk about it in terms of cleaner air, better health, so on and so forth, not as something which is hair, short shirts, and austerity, and so on and so forth. Danger that solutions can be gained. So the idea is, you have if you have um, clean development mechanism, other kind of market-based approaches. There are various ways that people can manipulate and gain this, which is problematic. And, you know, the action goes from the personal to the global, that you're doing things at all levels, which I think is interesting. Okay, so commons and climate change. Um, you know, I use her work in various ways, and I think when you have a thinker that it's not just they're part of a, a network, but they get mobilised in different ways and different things get accented. And I've got an approach to Ostrom's work. There are very different approaches to Ostrom's work. Although, in, you know, what I find, I'm, I'm coming very much from a Marxist eco-socialist point of view, and I find the scholarship from people on her work who are much more Marxian and free market is, is exemplary and very good. But her work can be used in different ways, mobilised in different ways, in a material way like other thinkers, any thinker. So there's a couple of things where, you know, I kind of emphasise. So, um, I think her approach of kind of deep democracy, of participation, I think is really important for dealing with climate change and other environmental problems. That if you, you know, have people negotiating, you have people involved, people involved in decision making, that's very, very powerful. And of course, there's a much wider debate around kind of failures of formal liberal democracy, distrust of politicians, you know, how we really deepen democracy and create participation. And I think we need that to solve climate change and other problems. Um, she wasn't a thinker who would go, capitalism, it's the, you know, efficient cause of ecological problems. Um, the closest I think you'd get to this, we talk about the roving bandit economy, where you would have ships that would go along and hoover up all the fish and so on. Um, but nonetheless, if the argument is that capitalism is based on a growth imperative, capitalism is based on the simplification of nature, that you can kind of take ideas of commons um, and collective use as a way of practically building a post-capitalist economy. So obviously the, 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 what you have in capitalism is we have our mobile phones and devices. Um, if we keep replacing them and upgrading them, that's good in this kind of system of profit and jobs and accumulation and so on and so forth. And there might be ways in the sense of kind of the Tim Jackson book of having prosperity without growth by actually more social sharing, public provision and so on. So I think she's got things to say about that. Um, I should probably begin to kind of round this off. So Ostrom and beyond, um, I think there are ways in which her work can be criticised. So coming from this kind of very methodological individualist approach, this approach that you, what you basically have in, is individuals and individual behaviour, though she kind of like sort of slightly outgrew that and had some criticisms of it, I know it's got some good points, it's very much about the individual, participation, respecting the individual. She didn't have an analysis of the kind of wider structural forces, such as imperialism, capitalism, so on and so forth. So in some ways her work is strikingly subversive, 
In other ways, it's very micro and not looking at kind of social structures that drive inequality and environmental damage and so on and so forth. So we might need to you know, reference other theorists as well. Um, another kind of criticism, um, and this will begin to kind of draw this together, is that she's very concerned about management of natural resources and seeing this, not that anything in her work is reduced to one slogan, but in a sense seeing it as a kind of issue of trust. You know, how do we trust each other and cooperate to manage environmental problems? And in many ways, this is very much driven by rationality, negotiation, getting people together. And of course, what we know is that politics and environmental management and what we do, every one of us as human beings, isn't driven by a set of you know, purely rational drives, that we're driven by emotion, um, you know, images, tropes, we can mobilise in certain ways. So you know, if you're going to deal with climate change, I would say it's multidimensional, but three very important dimensions. One is the sort of Ostrom dimension of management and governance and institutions and cooperation. Another one is the whole argument around conflict. So what we have in Britain is banks who are funding companies around the world to do immensely destructive things. There's, there's conflict and cost contestation. And then a third element is how do you, you know, mobilise images, narratives, tropes, get us engaged to kind of create the change. Uh, of course, Extinction Rebellion, I think that's been very, I, there are many criticisms of it, but that's been very good at mobilising people, getting emotional identification, getting us involved. So having kind of said these are potential criticisms, I'll go back to the start. And obviously, the tragedy of the commons, if we're aware of it, is a very powerful story. It's a very powerful image. It's a very powerful trope. And it's led to a kind of version of conservation and environmentalism, which is very much based about excluding people, about austerity, about having rules. And maybe there is a formal logic with the tragedy of the commons prisoner's dilemma, but above all, it's been a very, very strong image. So though Ostrom didn't look maybe at the kind of politics of image and effect and emotion, the fact that she you know, got us thinking in a critical way about that trope is very important. So, begin to wrap up. I, um, in my Anna Austin's Rules for Radicals, I kind of, you know, for radical, if we want to get change, I tried to kind of come up with some rules. I thought 13 was a nice sort of witchy number, which you would have approved of. Um, you know, so it's kind of think about institutions. Everything's institutions. Um, you know, Amber was saying this, you can design institutions differently, get different effects. Um, you know, we've all sorts of inter institutions, it's all over the web this as well, I'm a horrible self-publicist. Um, you know, that we, we think of institutions as natural and unchangeable, we can, we can do them differently. Doesn't mean they're perfect, we won't get perfection. But, you know, we can redesign things, we can change things, we can look at you know, the Austin stuff is about make, looking at the rules, institutions, and habits we have, making them more transparent so we can change them. So this could explain this could turn into five hours of me. Uh, problem solving. So it's not this is the way. It's like there's a problem. How do we deal with it? Um, embrace diversity. That's always good. But be very specific. You know, not this kind of broad brush. This you know, very specific. Um, so there's more of this. But I will begin to round up. Um, so I've just given you some readings. Um, so the nice interview, I think all this is going to be online. So there's a nice interview with her talking about climate change there. Um, Reclaiming the Commons, 1995. That's a really kind of key document about her work and Commons. Um, this team at the Ecologist magazine wrote, did a special issue, and it was around sort of Rio, and then they all got sacked. Wonderful document. Um, a polycentric approach for coping with climate change. So she did actually, I'm not making much, she writes about climate change, and then comments and contradiction. So I will stop there. <laughs>